Welcome to the podcast, Sir Steve Webb. Hello there. Nice to be with you. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, Steve, um, for those who don't know you, and I know lots of our listeners will know you, but can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, sure. So the uh, the day job now, as of February this year, um, changing job just before lockdown was a, an exciting thing to do. But uh, I had a few weeks with my new firm, Lane Clark and Peacock, who are pension consultants. But um, perhaps better known for five years as the Minister of State for Pensions between 2010 and 2015. Uh, that was the final period of my 18 years as an MP. So a lot of time in political life, public policy. I was an academic before with the Institute of Fiscal Studies and at Bath University. Uh, and uh, once you get into the pensions world, you somehow can never escape, really. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, they're vitally important, of course, to our listeners at the Retirement Cafe. You know, they're um, people thinking about retiring, people in their retirement. What is it about pensions that fascinate you? <laughs> I think one of the most interesting things is that every aspect of your life has an impact on your pension outcome. So, for example, whether you get married or not, whether you have kids or not, whether you own your own home and the impact of housing equity in retirement, the sort of job you have, whether you're in a big firm or a small firm, you know, everything affects your pension and therefore good pensions policy needs to be very, very broad. Although there's a hell of a lot of technical detail and I now work with some very, very specialist people, actually to understand and make good pension policy, you have to think about family formation and how old people are when they have children and, you know, the jobs market and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's, there's always something else to learn. Mm. When what age were you when you first started thinking seriously about pensions? <laughs> well, funny enough, so I, I graduated at the age of twenty-one and worked for the Institute for Fiscal Studies, but mainly on working age benefits and things like that. And a few years later, I realised my colleagues were writing about what they called the personal pension stampede. So this was the late nineteen eighties, early nineties, when the government was furiously shoveling money into personal pensions to get people saving. And my colleagues were essentially writing articles saying, you know, this is large amounts of free money. Why wouldn't you? So I took out my first pension, which was with a company called Equitable Life. You may have heard of them. Ah, yes. And uh, so I, funny enough, many years later, I got a payment out of the Equitable Life Compensation Scheme, which I legislated for, as I recall. So, <laughs> so, so not all my pension choices have been good ones, shall we say. No, no. Well, I mean, pensions, sadly, are complicated. Um, this idea of putting money aside, whether it's into your state benefits or into your o occupational, i.e. your work pension scheme, which I know we'll touch a little bit later, or, um, or even just saving for a, a, a rainy day, a, f a future pot. Um, it's hard for the man, woman in the street to get there, to, to, to get a real level of understanding, isn't it? I, I think... To be fair, we've probably all made it far more complicated for people than it need be. And actually, I think the beauty, and again, we may talk about this, about automatic enrolment, is that these days, to some extent, you just have to not opt out. You know, that's, that's, that's what you have to do for many decades. So, you know, my, my two kids are in their early 20s. And, you know, if the present crisis ends and they're able to get good jobs with pensions, all they have to do at 20-something is just, just go with the flow. And that gets them started and somebody else will invest the money for them. And maybe 30 years later, they'll start to engage. But as long, you know, so I think for many years, requiring people to engage and to opt in just wasn't working. And we were down to a third of the private sector workforce having any pension provision at all. Yeah. Um, you know, something had to change, basically. Yeah, yeah. And of course, um, the state pension, I mean, you know, as, as five years as pension minister, you know, you undertook some pretty major projects you know, changes to the state pension. I mean, the state pension, I mean, I did it for my pensions exams. I mean, wow. The legislation and the history into the state pension is just vast. Uh, how, how do you expect people to, you know, understand this stuff? Yeah. Well, what, one of the things I wanted to do was create a new simple state pension. So the goal of the new system, and again, take my kids as an example. So they will have done all of their work in life since the rules changed in 2016. Now, they're, the, they're the simple case, if you like. And basically, they do 35 years of work in a 50-year working life. They will get the flat rate, whatever it is, just under 9,000 a year at the moment. End of story. No contracting out, no, no nothing. Just that, and they will know that. They, that figure will be known. Most people will get it. 
if you spend your life in the country, that is pretty much the figure you will get. And it will all be much more predictable. And that was my goal. The same for male and female. So if you're a higher earner or a low earner or a carer, you still end up with the same pension. And that was one of my goals as well. The problem we had was that you can't forget about history. Oh. You couldn't start with a blank sheet of paper in 2016 and say, well, we, it doesn't matter what you've been doing in the last 40 years. We've just changed our minds. So the transition from the old system to the new system has all sorts of sort of safeguards. And if you would have got more on that, then you get this and so on. So the transition is messy, almost inevitably. But it is already the case that more than half the people who retire today will retire on the flat rate. Yeah. Uh, and by the end of this decade, that will be 80 percent. So, you know, we will be in a situation where at least the state bit will be very predictable for most people most of the time. It will get them to a basic minimum. You know, they shouldn't starve. And then they will know that if they want more on that, they just have to not opt out of the thing they get in work and so on. You know, So I think we will be in a better place. But the transition is always painful. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as an advisor, we, um, as a financial planner, obviously, we take um, state pensions into, a, into account in anyone's future cash flow, their retirement forecasting, you know, what, what, what money is going to be coming into the pot. And we can obviously look at someone's career history, we can look at their contribution record, we can complete some forms, etc. But I come across anomalies again and again and again. And the clients sit with me and they go, can you explain this? And I look at it and to give you an example, I've got a couple I'm working with at the moment who uh, they've been living in the, in the USA for a number of years, but they were earning profits and paying national insurance in the UK throughout their period of time. And they're good as gold. Accountant did all their numbers for them, paid the relevant tax, paid the national insurance across, et cetera, et cetera. And so when we get the forecast, we look at it and we go, well, so how's one of you? <laughs> By the way, this is a partnership and, 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 and they'd always work together. And I said, so how is it that one of you has got a contribution record of, you know, 32 years and the other one's got 10? <laughs> you know, how, do, how, <laughs> how does this happen? And then, so then you think, well, that's got to be relatively easy to unravel. Letter after letter after letter. And I'm, I'm, you know, still we've got five years before we're going to claim. But I'm hoping we might get there by then. You know, yeah. it, it, this is hard work. And, and there are so many different bits that can go wrong. I mean, so it, it, it's easy to forget that, that your national insurance record runs for half a century. So, you know, before you even start drawing a pension, you're going back half a century to when you left school or whatever it is. And then there are people today who are, you know, elderly widows whose husbands uh, were, you know, uh, whose records go back even further. There are people, you know, pensions in payment today are based on national insurance that were paid essentially after the Second World War, you know, 1948 or something, you know. So you can see why decades of records, it wouldn't take more than a tiny fraction of a percent to be wrong for thousands and thousands of people to get the wrong number. So even just at retirement, I, you know, I come across people who say, well, I've worked for the firm for seven years. HMRC have got no record of any of my NI. I know I work there. I've got my pay, you know, uh, and the company's gone bust. And it's just, just proving basic facts is a real challenge, but worth persevering. And I, I did a case with the Financial Times the other day, and, we, you know, we persevered with HMRC. And eventually they said, oh, well, we'd better check the microfiche. So, so somebody digs out the microfiche reader, blows the dust off, it puts up the slides, and guess what? The NI records there. Right. So you really, really do have to persevere. Yeah, yeah. The next complication that I come across is um, people trying to top up their missing service years. And they get quoted a number, and they get quoted a number of numbers that they can pay additional contributions in. But sometimes they can pay those additional contribution, contributions, but actually not get any benefit. Yeah. That's so right. they're told on one hand, you can make up these added years. <coughs> but then you need to go to a different department to find out whether that actually makes any difference. Now, now I'm sorry, but that's just nuts, surely. Yeah, it, it is. And I think we may soon be at a point where that's much easier for people. Because you can now go online and get your state pension forecast. Yeah. Uh, and by and large, if you can battle through the government ID process, you know, 
you can not only see what you've got so far, what you could get, and your year-by-year NI record, which is a hell of a step forward from posting off a form BR19 or whatever it is, you know. So that's a big, big step in the right direction. What I was working on in office and what eventually will happen is a what if. So you'd be able to go on that site and say, okay, so I'm not on the full. What if I pay this year? <clears throat> what would it do to my pension? And that would solve all of this. But at the moment, you can't. And the biggest sort of rule of thumb, and this is a rule of thumb, not advice, is um, post-2016, you're pretty safe. Yeah. So because the rules change in 2016, and that's when your sort of pension is benchmarked, if you're short of the full amount by 2016, extra years, voluntary or actual post-2016, on the whole, are worth doing. And as you know, the rate is very heavily subsidised. So it's dirt mm. cheap, basically. Um, anything before 2016 is a much greyer area, and you really have to look at the individual case. But... But with every passing year we go beyond 2016, more and more voluntary contributions should be a fairly straightforward decision. Yeah, yeah. So as always, which I must admit I've said many times, but I'll always continue to <coughs> um, get your forecast, get your record, check that they check that they're they're what you think they should be, and then if they're not, start that correspondence um to try and work out why it's missing what's gone on and, and maybe get some advice now i know that you've got a bit of a campaign going on at the moment <laughs> <laughs> that i read out and i and i've downloaded your paper today excellent um and had a good short written test <laughs> the lcp uh, are thousands of older women being shortchanged on their state pension tell me about this yeah, so I do a weekly column for the This Is Money website and an um, elderly couple wrote in and said, um, my wife rang the DWP and um, to change address or something. And a nice lady on the phone said, oh, Mrs. Jones, you don't seem to be getting the right amount of pension. We'll have a look at that. And it turned out that the lady uh, wasn't getting what she used to be entitled to under the old system, which is 60% of her husband's basic state pension. So not 60% of his total pension, 60% of the basic bit. So in today's money, he can have 134.25, which is the full basic pension plus other stuff. She can have 60% of that. So if he's getting full whack, she can have £80.45 a week. Well, this lady wasn't. So um, they applied for it and they got it and they backdated it 12 months. And then um, the couple said, well, hang on a minute. We've been underpaid 12 years, not 12 months. Where's the rest of it? And we discovered something that I never knew, which is until 2008, this uplift for married women didn't just happen. It didn't just happen when the husband turned 65, you had to apply for it. And they didn't, <clears throat> because they didn't know. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so um, you had to apply for it. They didn't know about it. When we challenged the DWP, they said, well, A, the law was you had to apply for it. So that's her problem, not ours. But as an, because we're nice people, we used to write to people. And as soon as you hear, we used to write to people, you know, you automatically know, well, yeah, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but certainly not everybody got letters. Because, you know, the sort of people who write to this is money are pretty engaged. And if they got a letter saying you can have some free money filling this form, they'd have done it. Yes. So patently, she didn't get the letter and all she can get is 12 months back dating. So, so I learned that this was an issue, the pre-2008 people. So the reason I refer in the title of the paper to older women is, of course, your husband turned 65 before 2008 let's say that makes him 77 plus, you're probably late 70s or whatever as well. So there's a significant number of women who are missing out on something they needed to claim. And if they do claim, they'll get a higher pension now and 12 months back dating. So we ran the story and then there were other women who wrote in and said, oh, this is me, but my husband turned 65 after 2008. At which point it should have happened automatically. The computer should just given them the money and didn't. So when we take these cases to the VWP, they said, oh, yeah, no, computers got it wrong. We'll backdate the money all the way to the point where it should have been paid, which can be 10 years or whatever. And we're yeah. getting people with 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 pounds of refund. I had a lady a few hours ago emailed me, never heard of her, never spoken to her, seen the story. Thanks, Mr. Webb, just got 16,000 quid in my bank account. Wow. So, um, you know, and so uh, the paper is based on a freedom of information request I put into the government to just get a stab at how many people were talking to it. You know, it, you know, systems go wrong, you know, odd cases go wrong. And I wanted to know if it was systematic. And I struggle to get a number less than tens of thousands of women not getting the right pension. So we created a, a calculator website where people can put their basic pension information and check if it's them. 
We've had 135,000 visits to the site. 100,000 of them have filled in the survey. They drop out as they go down, you know, wrong age, wrong amount, etc. And about 7,000 at the bottom look as though they're underpaid. That's just the people we've been able to find. Well, if we can find 7,000 one at a time, if the government used their record, how many thousand could they find? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you think you're in that um, spot, you know, uh, what can you do about it? So the, 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 the simple list of questions is, first of all, for the woman, you reached pension age before the 6th of April 2016. So you're an old system pensioner, which means you're, you're now sort of 67 plus, that kind of age. Your husband is already over pension age because this only kicks in when he gets to pension age. And you're getting less than 60% of his basic pension. So if your husband had a full working life, he's on the maximum. If you're not getting £80.45, you should be. That's roughly how it works. Now, if he had gaps in his record, time out of the country, time sick, retired early, he might not be getting the full 144. You, your 60% of his might be less, therefore. So it's, it's 60% of whatever he was getting. Frankly, if you tick those boxes, you ring the pension service. The contact numbers are on gov.uk. Um, and most of the time, they fix it, and they fix it pretty quickly. We get people who, you know, heard the story on Moneybox on Radio 4 on the Saturday, and by the following Friday, the money was in the bank account. So, you know, when it works, it's great. But what we do get is people on the phone saying, oh, no, this is not true. So people ring up having checked it. And what's happening, I think, is the people on the pension service call lines have all been diverted to do universal credit claims, you know, right. which you would do. Right. If you were the government, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what you'd do. You'd take all your experts, put them on the key priority, and then relatively junior people and inexperienced people are now answering the calls. And they've obviously got scripts, one of which is, you know, Steve Webb's an idiot, usually. I mean, I've, I've certainly heard that. <laughs> Don't want to believe what he says. Uh, Martin Lewis doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, you, you, and people say, oh, no, you don't qualify because of the triple lock. What? You know, people have had all sorts of, you know. And one young woman, she rang for a gram that was, was fobbed off. She contacted me and I said, no, no, you're right. Ring them back again. She rings back, speaks to somebody different who said, oh, terribly sorry, dear. You know, yes, there, there is a problem here. We'll fix it. Yeah. Yeah. So a bit of tenacity as well to, um, to stick to the plan. And, and, and you know, it, it, it is difficult, all this stuff, but I do think, I do think us, uh, the, the population has to, has to create some, has to educate themselves on this stuff. You know, this is important um, benefits that they're, they're available, the things that they've contributed to. And, uh, you know, the, the state pension is something they're entitled to. And therefore, to rely totally on government to pay it out um, and to pay out the right amount, I think that actually you've got to turn around and go, look, we need to understand this as well and make sure that we do get the right entitlement. It is. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. I think I think the onus is on government when designing systems not to require the average punter to crawl through all this stuff, understand it. You know, by all means, when you come to private pensions, you know, the state has said, look, we're going to get you to the start. We're going to put you in a private pension, but now you need to engage. I get that. I would accept that. The idea that we should expect 77 year old women to know what a category BL pension is. You know, I just think the system's let them down, to be honest. Yeah, I, I suppose I'm not talking to the nth degree of the, uh, the thing, but I think getting a, a general handle on what you should be yeah. eligible for. Yeah, how getting the forecast. Like yeah. You no, know, the, the, there needs to be some kind of responsibility. Um, in fact, we're, in fact, obviously, we're in the middle of the uh, of, of the lockdown kind of at the moment, and um, I've talked to a number of people about homeschooling. And uh, the kids have, you know, the kids have been taught at home some maths and things. And, and every parent I've spoken to is kind of going, gosh, I'm finding it quite challenging. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I say, so do you remember, do you remember, you know, some of the maths you, you're trying to teach your kids? Do you remember learning yourself? And they're going, no, not especially. And I, I was talking to a plumber who came around to do some, um, uh, I've got some solar panels uh, on my roof and he was fixing them. And he's a pretty technical guy, you know, knows all about this kind of stuff and signs off significant systems and, you know, and, and passed all his tickets, etc. And I said, you, so you're struggling with your nine-year-old's maths then, are you? <laughs> he's like, yeah, absolutely. I'm saying there's something fundamentally wrong here, isn't it? Why aren't we teaching the stuff that we need to know? 
and the mm. stuff that you really haven't used <laughs> since leaving school, but you're still obviously a technical guy and using maths on a regular basis, you know, but understanding pensions, investments, mortgages, interest, you know, the, the, the financial education needs to be part of maths, I think, much more in the education system. Yes, I, again, I have a slightly heretical view on this. I mean, I think the evidence is that if you do something called financial education, it doesn't work. You know, uh, there's plenty of evidence, you know, banks do it, they go into schools, they feel good, they get nice photos to go on their websites. And a year later, the evidence is nobody can remember anything. And I think what you do need is just in time relevant stuff, you know, so you get a class of 18 year olds who are about potentially to get a first pay packet. And they are very interested in knowing what's coming out of it and the tax and the NI and the pension. All that, you know, they will listen to that. Or someone's just got married and, you know, they're applying for a mortgage. They really want to know how mortgages work. Or, you know, you've had a child. It's the first time you thought about life insurance. You know, so if we can, you know, and with the big data and all of that, you know, Google know, you know, there's the sort of classic story about Google uh, spotted that someone was pregnant before they knew they were because of their, you know, their searches and all the rest of it. And they sent them something in the post, you know, an advertiser sent them something in the post and it was, why am I getting pregnancy stuff? And a week later they did a test, you know. So if we <laughs> use the data we've got, we can really get timely stuff to people that they will engage with, not generic financial education, but frankly, people just, just don't, doesn't work, I don't think. No, no. Great. Well, I'm going to, uh, I know we're going to have opportunity to talk to you again, Steve. So uh, about some of the other topics that I want to uh, talk to you about, like auto enrollment and that type of stuff that I know you are very much part of. Um, so, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for this morning. And um, okay. I look forward to talking with you again. Great. Thanks, Justin. Cheers. So until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement.